Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort in creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. It is hotter than a whorehouse on dime day in my apartment right now. <laughs> That's a saying. <laughs> my grandmother used to say that when she was salty. She'd have a few drinks in her. She's a uh, summer lady. Salt- salty ladies that runs in our families we should say this off the top of the show we use salty language in this podcast don't get freaked out if we use the f word or say quite a few things i think today because this person we're talking about today totally pisses me off Mm -hmm. you can same yep you could find us on all the socials we do have a basic facebook page we don't really check it that often we're really more about the facebook group and yes you do have to answer a couple of questions to join the group because we're trying to keep the group safe and fun it is an awesome place to hang out just listen to a couple of shows it's not that hard to figure out what the answers to the questions are Mm -hmm. don't panic okay (laughs) i didn't know there'd be a test (laughs) can i have an oral instead anyway (laughs) We are on Twitter at Creep Pie because somebody had What a Creep podcast for 10 years on Twitter and never used it. Creep. We're on Instagram at What a Creep podcast. And I want to say bonjour to all of our French fans and Parisians out there. You guys have been joining our Instagram page. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also have an old timey email if you want to reach out to us. <laughs> Max, that's where he likes to reach out to us. It's yeah. <laughs> what a creep podcast at gmail.com. That's for common suggestions, you know, for creeps, also for non creeps. We're always looking for suggestions for non creeps. Please. We have stickers, and I forgot to tell you, Sonia, I got these new oh. stickers, and they're <gasps> really wicked cute. I'm going to send you a picture of them. They're like a yes. little over an inch tall and wide, and they're just stupid adorable you could just stick that on your laptop or whatever oh do you want to tell them about the website really quick yes you can go to whatacreeppodcast.com and it's everything you ever wanted to know about our podcast but were afraid to ask it's also got a link to our merch shop where you can get tote bags and t-shirts and uh journals and all kinds of fun stuff and it has a link to our patreon page Which is a great thing to bring up. We want to thank the new people that just joined our Patreon page. We have Katie, Catherine, Halima, Victoria, Laura, and Christine. You guys rock. Thank you so very much. We put out bonus episodes there starting in September. We're going to bring back the newsletter. Yay, it's happening. Thank you so much. And please send us pictures of yourselves with the merch or just you listening to the podcast or your pets we love when you send us pictures of your pets that always makes us happy also on itunes i want to thank chetty cat for leaving us a five-star review thank thank you we love five-star reviews we certainly do all right sonia are you ready to rock um maybe (laughs) why don't i just read to you for a little bit how does that sound (laughs) Okay. That seems a little more like what's really going to happen today. Our creep today might come as a shock to people. Just calm your tits. It's, (laughs) we have all the evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to, if it's upsetting, then don't listen to this particular episode. That's okay. But I want to say also, I forgot to mention every episode we end with someone who's not a creep. So Correct. it's not all just a big shit pile, right? We're also going to bring up someone who's pretty great. I don't even know who it is this week. This <gasps> week, It's a surprise. I forgot to ask you. Oh, yeah. I'll keep it to myself. All right. Just keep that in your hip pocket until we're ready. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you ready to rock? No. I'm going to keep asking until you say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Eric Patrick Clapton is a musician of such renown. He is the only person inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Three times. He has won several Grammys and was given the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006. Some of the bands he has been a part of include the Yardbirds, Cream, Blind Faith, Delaney and Bonnie, and Derek and the Dominoes. You know, all those hacks. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually a fan of his music. This is going to be tough. 
No, he, it's a bummer. It's a bummer for me. He has played at London's Royal Albert Hall over 200 times, the most of any artist. His life has also been marked by addiction issues and tragedies, making him one of the most dependable guests for charity concerts over the last 40 plus years. Seriously, you have a charity concert event in England or America, he pretty much will just kind of show up. <laughs> he creates well, That's good. Which is all good. Our, yeah, our creeps, they're not always all bad. Right, right. We do point out the good things that they do. He created the Crossroads Center in Antigua, Antigua to help people with addiction issues. I said that right, right? And Maybe. Tiga? I don't know. <laughs> you know. You know you can't ask me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Antigua to help people with addiction issues and holds charity concerts on his own to raise money at the center to help people lead sober lives. We support that. Mm-hmm. In his mid-70s now, he's 76. He is a family man to four daughters and one grandson. He seems to have totally calmed down after years of self-abuse and abusive behavior towards the women in his life. And so what we're going to focus on today, well, is on that abusive behavior. He's also made some super racist remarks. I had to yep. look them up because I'm American. I'm unless you can't tell. Some of these this British slang was kind of shocking to me. I also aligned himself with one of the biggest assholes in British politics. We'll get to that. Mm-hmm. And recently, just in the last year, he decided that following the protocols of COVID prevention was just not to his liking. He teamed up with famous curmudgeon Van Morrison to first record a dopey song, fighting the lockdowns <laughs> and wearing masks <laughs> to stop the part of the spread of the fucking asshole. It's such a stupid song, too. He also decided he's going to go on tour in America this fall. He's still That's still on his website, ericclapton.com, for those who are interested. He refuses to play anywhere that requires the audience to have proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. Cool. Because he thinks that's discrimination. That's hilarious. Which I, is hilarious because you're going to yeah. find out why. Mm-hmm. This episode will focus on his terrible chauvinistic and abusive behavior towards women for decades, mostly his ex-wife, Patty, his racist outbursts in 1976, the rock against racism cultural movement that happened because of it, which was super awesome. And we're going to talk about his many health woes over the last 40 years and why his reaction to the COVID vaccine and his misinformation campaign is super fucked up. Trigger warnings, domestic violence, sexual assault, racism, and misogyny, and my pronunciation for some things. <laughs> Just, it's so, best. so unfortunate that your, your podcasting partner is me who can't pronounce anything correctly, <laughs> so I can't even help you. Eric's origin story can be summed up in a way that we have talked about many times on the show. If it's not one thing... It's your mother. Mm-hmm. Mother Pat was born, uh, sorry, was 16 years old in 1944, World War II England, when she had a fling with a Canadian soldier who turns out had a family back home. When she gave birth to Eric, the soldier took off back to his homeland, and Eric was left with his grandparents to raise him. It was a big deal at the time for an unwed teenage girl. Absolutely. You know, I don't, I don't blame her for that. Until he was 10, he thought his mother was a sister. Wow. Yeah. That's like movie stuff. Well, it's Jack Nicholson. That's his real story. Yep. Yeah. His mom left for a while, and then when she returned, she had remarried, or had married, excuse me, and had children, whom she seemed to prefer over him. And this created this anger he had against her, and a lot of women, for mm. most of his life. His grandparents completely adored him, and he described himself as an artistic loner. He discovered the guitar in his teens, and when he graduated from school, he took off for London, started busking. You know, when you're playing the playing for change? Yeah, yeah. And he made friends with people, and his favorite music was specifically African-American blues music. He was super fucking into the blues. That's all he cared about. And he was so picky that when he was in the Yardbirds, which was a big band in the mid-'60s, and do you know the song For Your Love? For your love. Do, 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 yes. Do. Okay. It was too poppy for him. He's like, we're supposed to be a blues band. This is bullshit. He just left. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Such a prick. I was just thinking <laughs> you're like, he's so into the blues. I'm like, he's probably a fucking drag at parties, <laughs> right? 
where he's just like, I'm really into the blues. You're probably not into it like I am. And but it's shut up. I, I get it. You like the blues. I was listening to the live album, the third track. The one in Detroit where they do the I'm like, I don't give a shit. No one cares. <laughs> All right. Around the time he first saw Jimi Hendrix play in London, he joined the band Cream, which consisted of Jack, Bruce, Ginger Baker, and Eric, and they took off right away. I really love Cream. In 68, he became friends with the Beatles, especially with guitarist George Harrison. They completely hit it off. They're both, you know, music people. Yeah. And George was married to former model Patty Boyd, who was a Adorable. Everybody drink. That's Everybody a, drink. That's a dorking out show reference, by the way. As soon as Eric laid eyes on her, and this he says this over and over again over years in many, many interviews. And then, um, oh, I forgot to mention. Sorry, let me do this really quick. Yeah. My sources. Vulture, oh, yeah. at Eric Clapton, Wikipedia, Rolling Stone, Ultimate Classic Rock, the White Riot documentary, which came out in 2020. Clapton, his autobiography. Clapton, the autobiography. <laughs> Patty Boyd's autobiography, Wonderful Tonight, Rock Against Racism, the wiki page, Eric Clapton, Life in 12 Bars, which is a documentary, Daily Beast, Enoch Powell wiki, The Guardian, and The Independent. Okay, let me find my place. As I was saying, he was completely obsessed with Patty Boyd and immediately was infatuated. He already had girlfriends, many of them, but he really focused on Patty and he would send her love letters and he'd try to call her. And he was so obsessed with her, he even dated her teenage sister for a while, <gasps> just so he could oh. be close to her. Dang, that's messed up. It's really, really messed and up. She, and she was still married to George Harrison. They were married for quite a while. Yeah. What a creep. Yeah. He, yeah. He, and he, years later, he says it, part of it was because musicians were obsessed with the Beatles. They wanted that fame, and they, but they also wanted the respect. Like, they had it all. And, and he just kind of thought of Patty as an extension of that, which is not a great thing to say, but... Anyway. No, it isn't. He would write her love letters, beg her to, re to run off with him, and she'd be like, nah, I'm married, I got George. <laughs> this sort of went back and forth for years, along with his drinking and his drug use. And I'm going to get a little personal here and say that I do have personal experience with alcohol abuse. My younger brother was an alcoholic most of his life. He died from it. And being an addict does not make you a creep. No, not at all. We're talking about destructive behaviors that just can't be explained away by having an addiction. Yes. Okay. According to his autobiography, he got so desperate that he told Patty if she didn't leave George for him, he would start taking heroin. Never mind that, that... he was already using it. <sighs> that is so messed up. To, like, put that kind of shit on someone else. It's all... It's so manipulative. It's so... It's so... Ugh. In 1970, as part of the band Derek and the Dominoes, he wrote the song Layla for her. And she was super flattered, but she still turned him down. Side note, you know the piano solo that happens at the end of the song? It's pretty mm -hmm. famous. It's in all the Martin Scorsese movies. Yes, it is. <laughs> Eric's... Drummer Jim Gordon claimed he wrote that medley and he played it on the record, the drummer. Turns out he actually stole it from Rita Coolidge <gasps> and she had a song called Time and there's singing over that medley and she was never given, pro given proper credit. Now, Eric Clapton didn't know this. so this, But anyway, in case you're wondering, if you just Google that or you go on YouTube, you yeah. can find it for yourself. That drummer, Jim Gordon, would later have a psychotic breakdown and murder his mother. Oh, my gosh. He is in a mental hospital to this day. Wow. Yeah. Back to Patty and George. Ah, oh, George was my favorite Beatle, too. He's so handsome. They're both. All of them were so handsome. <laughs> it would be a mustache ride I'd have to take. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> the line starts to the left, Margo. Exactly. <laughs> He's so dreamy. All right. But he cheated on her left and right. He would ignore her for weeks and weeks while he was studying meditation and Eastern philosophy. He was also getting high and banging chicks, by the way. Oh, womp, womp. Patty put up with this because that was how she was raised. Her father cheated on her mother. Her stepdad cheated on her mother. She just thought you had to put up with it. Yeah. A lot of women, by yeah. the way, 
thought you did. And a lot of women still think you do. Some people it's do. A thing. Yeah. Eric did finally win her over and she did leave George for him. And at first he was delighted. But soon enough, he got bored. Surprise. According to his autobiography, Eric thinks her, his obsession was because she was married to a Beatle. He was so envious of the band that he wanted what they had, which meant he wanted a Beatle wife of his own. For him, sexual attraction was vital. He said sex was like 90% of a marriage. I'm like, no, it's not. But anyway, mm. when that started to fade, he started cheating on her. And I mean, right away. That sucks. In both his and Patty's autobiographies... She was treated horribly by him. He was drunk most of the time. He was cruel. He was rude. He was dismissive. He was sarcastic. He would withdraw from her for days on end and then attack her for the slightest thing. He admits that he beat her. He admits he ignored her as punishment and that more than once he forced himself on her when she said no to sex, which is that rape. Is- that is rape, and that is awful. Awful. This is so fucked up. He admits to it. Uh, some of the ways he withdrew were fishing. He's one of those. He, he loves to fish. He can go fishing for hours at a time all by himself. He, he's a loner. Yeah. Also, he liked to go to drinking at the pub. A lot of drinking at the pub, mm-hmm. and bringing all these people home with him, and then have Patty make meals for all these people and take care of oh. them. Oh, also sounds shitty. Also, he loved going on the road. Pretty soon after they got together, he made a no women allowed rule while touring. And he admits that he had girlfriends on the road. And Patty was just a big cramp in his style. What a dick. Yeah, I just saw Almost Famous again recently. And I'm just like, oh, God, the wives of these men. I know. In all of this, though, he said he was honest with her about the cheating. He would tell her who he was cheating on her with and when. And she stuck with Oh, him. well, that makes it okay. He, ta- he, re- he admits that's shitty, by the way. He admits all of this yeah. is totally shitty, and he's not proud of it. But she, she said that he's just, he just picked away at her self-esteem, and she loved him. And he also isolated her. They had this country house that was beautiful, by the way. I mean, I wouldn't sneer at it i mean i would be like oh this is nice but this is this late you know 70s and 80s they had the telephone and a television set there's no, she didn't have friends they weren't friends with the neighbors like her family was pretty far away like he kept her isolated and was mm-hmm. always checking on her but he was fucking around yeah she probably felt super dependent on him yes yeah he paid all the mm-hmm. bills too i mean that's yeah. you know now that doesn't mean she didn't have her fl- flings she did good for you patty but she had the good manners to break up with Eric when those things happened. And this constant making up and breaking up happens for the next several years. And those are the kind of couples I run away from. I can't even. <laughs> they are fucking yeah, tiresome. No. Mm-hmm. The Bickersons, you know? Yeah. This goes on for several years when Eric's manager tells him one day while he's touring the States, you need to get married. You, you have too much bad press lately. You need to get married. You should marry that Patty. And they get married. Sure. That's a great reason to get married. Yeah. And they look great. They look happy. She's, I mean, she's gorgeous. She looks beautiful. And this happens in 1979. Within a week, he was cheating on her and he kicked her off the road. <laughs> Such a prick. <laughs> Such an asshole. Once they married, this breaks my heart. Patty really wanted to have a baby, but she could not carry a child to term. They went to try IVF treatments, which were beginning to become an option in the early 80s. She tried many, many times over the years, and it was starting to cause her depression. There was times she tried, like a lot of codependent people do, she tried drinking with him. She tried Mm -hmm. doing drugs with him because you're like, at least I'm with them. I can take care of them. Something goes wrong. But at some point, he would always wind up screaming at her and keeping her isolated. If she was on the phone for, quote unquote, too long, he would pick up the line and tell her to hang up. If his dinner was late, he would have a fucking freak out. Oh, my God. He's totally controlling. Yeah. He, and he admits to this. And this was, you know, you read this in her book. Okay. One day, Eric came to Patty and he told her that he had met an Italian actress and he was in love with her. Her name was Lori Del Santo. And this is interesting. Patty's version versus his version. It was in 1985, and do you want to know the cherry on top? 
the the mistress got pregnant right away. Oh, that must have really hurt. She was devastated. <sighs> yeah. Devastated. And so they break up. She's like, well, you got to go. Like, this is mm-hmm. over. And he was just super happy about being a dad. And he just couldn't, like, stop talking about Oh, my about God. It. That must have hurt her so I much. I just think all that's that, in, the rage she must have tried to, like, just mm-hmm. swallow down and contain. Anyway, he leaves to start his new family. Now, according to Eric, when you read his book, he's immediately like, I think there's something suspicious with this woman. She kind of seems like a star fucker. She, he tells in one story, he says, she went off to do something and she left me alone at the house. I'm like, okay, maybe she had to run an errand and she didn't need you to fall. I mean, th- there's just the way you... Yeah. Right. He, so he, he's snooping. He's checking out her house and he finds these um, photo albums. And he's flipping through. It's like scrolling through the phone for all you kids out there that don't know what a photo right. album is. He's looking at her phone and he's um, at her photos and he notices that she has his pictures with all of these famous men. She was a TV personality, by the way. She had a show. She like so she met a lot of people. But he said she had the yeah. same phony smile in every picture. He fucked her anyway. She yeah. <laughs> he said she said I don't want to use birth control. Let's try to have a baby. And he goes okay, and they get pregnant right away. Mm. Yeah, and Connor, who was beautiful. Mm-hmm. was born mm-hmm. in April of 1986. When the baby was born, he called Patty first to tell her how excited we, she was. Oh, my like, God. What is the fuck, dude? Here, let me just rub this shit in your face. Yeah, yeah. Here, do you have a paper cut? Let me pour some lemon juice on it. Yeah, what a fucking asshole. Eventually, they divorced, and she cited his cruel treatment and his infidelity. She did get some money from him, but not nearly enough, in my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. Eric and Lori break up and co-parent for a little while, but that's mostly on Lori's end because Connor had an asthma attack a couple of times and Eric was like, I can't handle this. And so the boy was mainly raised in Italy, but Eric Clapton was, he started to, he tried a few times to get sober and somewhere in the late 1980s, it kind of clicked for him finally. Mm-hmm. So he's trying to be sober and be a responsible person. In, this is the fucking saddest thing ever. In 1991, no, I know. March 1991, Connor died. And it's horrifying. Lori called him to tell him they were staying at a hotel in New York. And he fell out of a window. And it's just horrifying. And to his credit, Clapton said he remained sober in honor of, of his son that must have been really really hard, really hard because i would that kind of that kind of loss i, do, I don't know how Mm-mm. well i don't think you ever you don't ever get over it no no but i think like that's a really incredible way to kind of look at it like yeah. move forward a few weeks after connor's death eric first he asked patty if she would go to the funeral in england and she's like, um, okay. She didn't really know the family or anything. But he was grateful that she was there. And then a few weeks later, he called her and she thought he was just checking in. He goes, hey, I got to tell you something. The media is going to be contacting you soon. It's about another kid I had out of wedlock a few years ago. Uh, it turns out he had a daughter having an affair with a woman in 1984. She was a married woman. And initially, she they decided she would raise the daughter with her husband, her then husband. And Eric would send money occasionally. And it's all kinds of messed up, but the daughter's name is Ruthie and she and Eric have a relationship now, but it's just the way she found out was like really messed up. Why does he keep dragging Patty back into his shit? He, I know. I'm like, just leave that poor woman alone. I know. Yeah. I don't know. All right, now let's go into Eric's racism because this story will kind of blow your fucking mind. Once again, I think I really need to make it clear to you people that I am American. I find British politics completely confusing. <laughs> you have a prime minister and a queen. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> 
and you wear wigs in courtrooms. There's all kinds of things I just Mm -hmm. don't completely understand. So I can't go too much into this person. But this is a conservative politician who's named Enoch Powell. I hope I said that right. Sounds right. I'm going to say so. He's an asshole, so who cares? Born in 1912, he was a poet and an author before serving in British Parliament, and he served in many positions between 1950 and 1987. From 1960 to 63, he was the Minister for Health, and one of his jobs was to look into the drug thalidomide. Do you, did you ever hear about the thalidomide babies? No. All right. This was a scare thing that they told us when I was a kid when they had sex ed. Basically, to scare you not to have sex. But there was this drug called thalidomide and it was developed in the early 60s. And it was to give to women who had really bad uh, morning sickness. Turns out it gave the kids many, many deformities. Oh, I've it never heard this. Yeah. The thalidomide babies. It's 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 the. Many, many bad jokes from Mm. shitty comedians. Um, Anyway, he was the Minister of Health, and this is the kind of person that he was. When he had a meeting with parents who tried to get him to investigate the drug, he not only showed no sympathy to them, he refused to see their children, these kids that were messed up from the drugs. He refused to see these kids and would not issue a warning about the drug because he didn't want to scare people. (sighs) He's a soul... In 1968, he was Shadow Secretary of State for Defense. I don't know what that means. I don't either. Yeah. And he gives an anti-immigration speech called the Rivers of Blood, which served as red meat for people who have been chomping at the bit to complain about immigrants in the UK. There was this bill that was going to be passed, and it was meant to combat racism and bigotry, making it a crime to refuse service or work to people based on their race. Well, Enoch didn't like this one bit. He went after black and Asian immigrants coming into the UK, and he says they're causing havoc in the community. And this story, one of the stories he tells, and he uses many slurs, I'm not going to repeat them, Mm -mm. but he tells a story about, and this, I'm telling you right now, this story is the phoniest of balonies I've ever heard in my life. Phony baloney is an American expression, by the way. (laughs) <clears throat> he says that the, uh, that he talked to a white woman from Wolverhampton, Wolverhampton, who lost her family in the war and now was being chased about her neighborhood by black people. They supposedly would leave excrement in her mailbox. They broke her windows and they called her a racialist. She did not want to rent rooms to black people but she was going to be worried she would be arrested if this new law passed. Uh, Enoch Powell said that proper integration could never happen because having a different colored skin is too big of a barrier for people to overcome. So there should be no immigration because it will change the way England looks and take jobs away from Brits. Uh, We hear all of this right now. Everything old is new again. Yep. Yes. He uses several racial slurs in the speech. He never, ever apologizes for that. I told you what they were off the air. You can look it up for yourself, kids. It also turns he's a big, fat fucking liar because that lady from Wolverhampton never existed. She was an urban myth he used to stoke racism for many years. In the 70s, there was this rising youth group, (laughs) not like Christian nice people. It was this (laughs) rising group of youth called the National Front, whose motto was, Keep Britain White. Oh, once again, everything old is new. Charming Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's an excellent documentary about this time called White Riot, which I never understood before. It's a song by The Clash, and I always thought The Clash were racist. It turns out they're not at all. I thought thought most punk rockers were racist because there's there's Nazi imagery for some of them. Not true. Not true. In August of 1976, Clapton was giving a show in Birmingham when he drunkenly started a racist speech. He first asked, are there any non-whites here? And then I'm going to read you this without the shitty parts. Okay. Yes. Wherever you are, I just think you should all leave. Not just <gasps> leave the hall, leave our country. I don't want you in the ro- here, in the room, or in my country. Listen to me, man. I think we should send them all back. 
Stop Britain from becoming a black colony. Get the foreigners out. Oh my God. Keep Britain white. Make America great again. And then he mentions some groups and mentions the effing Jamaicans. They don't belong here and we don't want them. This is a guy who, by the way, played the song I Shot the Sheriff, which is based on a (laughs) reggae song, asshole. He's such a piece of shit. This is England. This is a white country. We don't have any black people living here. I, we need to make clear that they are not welcome. England is for white people, man. This is Great Britain, a white country. What is happening us, to us for fuck's sake? Keep Britain white. Such bullshit. And if there were any people of color in that audience, he put them in crazy danger. In immense danger. He honestly, okay, I'll... The new music expressed an enemy, called him out for using black people for his music, including I Shot the Sheriff, which led to the creation of RAR, Rock Against Racism. Clapton wasn't the only one being a shithead, by the way. David Bowie was fascinated with Hitler. At the time, he called him the first rock star. Ooh. And how fascism is, is a, fascism is needed to create order. Oh. Yeah. Everything old is new again. Bowie eventually recanted all this, by the way. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 I was fucked up. That was wrong. Sorry. Um, groups that did help raise money for RAR included The Clash, Steel Pulse, The Buzzcocks, Elvis Costello, and Graham Parker. And this is directly from Eric's book. In 2007, by the way. I never really understood or been directly affected by racial conflict. I suppose being a musician helped me transcend the physical side of the issue. When I listened to music, I was fairly disinterested in where the players came from or their skin color. He doesn't see color. Oh, cool. Interesting, then, that 10 years later, I was labeled a racist for making drunken remarks about Enoch Powell on stage in Birmingham, England. I have since learned to keep my opinions to myself, though that was never meant as a racial statement. He mentioned, by the way, in the speech, like, hey, do you guys, are you fans of Enoch Powell? Well, that, that's what he went into that whole right. He doubled down on his Enoch Powell love for many years after this, calling him at one point a very brave man. It wasn't until 2018, during a radio interview, he finally said he regrets the words he used and was taking back the racism. He called himself, huh. I was a semi-racist at the time. Semi. Which is not a thing. You said, and he said, I don't get it. I love black music. I had a black girlfriend. I'm like, because you're a white supremacist. Yeah. I'm a part time racist. <laughs> half racist. What an asshole. Yeah. I'm half racist. It's anyway. And since COVID hit, music halls and concerts were just about nearly non existent for almost a year. And that's scary and financially devastating for many performers. You know, but you're a millionaire and you've got mm-hmm. mansions all over the world. You've got, you know, you can get a jet right away if you have yachts. I mean, yeah, I, I get you feel bad for other musicians, but he teams up with Van Morrison and they decided to solve this problem that they would record an anti mask, anti lockdown song called Stand and Deliver. Now, it's to support a charity that's supposed to, it's called the Lockdown Financial Hardship Fund. Which, you know, I want to support that, but you can't do that using anti-mask propaganda. Yeah, what the fuck? It just completely (laughs) doesn't make any fucking sense. And it's just dumb. In the spring of 2021, Eric got his jab at the urging of his family, meaning he got his shot, vaccination Mm -hmm. shot. And he describes the side effects as, quote unquote, disastrous, with his hands and feet feeling numb and useless. He feared I would never play again, is what he said. Mm -hmm. He said the propaganda said that the vaccine is safe, but I have peripheral neuropathy and should never have gotten the jab. I have no idea if his doctor prescribed this or not. But people, some people do get side effects Mm -hmm. and they run the gamut. I mean, it's fighting viruses in your body. In In response to this, he said... I'm not going to perform in any venue that requires a COVID test or vaccine clearance as it is discrimination. 
Brian. That's fucking trash. <laughs> Brian May called him a Fruit Loop for this. <laughs> God bless Brian May. <laughs> For that, and also because Eric, Eric supports fox hunting, which is fucked up. Yeah, no, no, no. So I want to finish by giving you the 411 on Eric Clapton's various illnesses. Mm-hmm. In 1981, while on tour, he was hospitalized with five bleeding ulcers, one the size of a small orange, as he describes it. He had to Ew. cancel his tour and go to rehab. Also, this man took heroin for years, and he was a drinker of like enormous proportions for years that will compromise your health in 2014. He told new music express NME that touring was quote unquote unbearable for him. And he had odd ailments that could force him to stop playing on stage for good. He had to cancel shows because of back pain and he had been diagnosed back in 2016 with neuropathy issues and said his guitar playing was compromised as a result He also said he has tinnitus and hearing issues. Nerve damage causes pain that radiates up and down his legs. And in 2017, he canceled several shows in L.A. due to severe bronchitis. Much of this can be traced back to his alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. So he's blaming the jab for making him sick when he's been sick for a long time, he's had a lot of issues for a long time and he's not understanding like how things get spread. It's so fucked up that the people who have gotten the vaccine are then encouraging other people not to get the vaccine. It's ridiculous. I'm like, shut the fuck up. And that's our creep this week. Eric Clapton. Good job, Margo. He is trash. <laughs> he's just trash. I can't believe he's so shitty to Patty Boyd. And then yeah. and then to keep just dragging her back into his life. I, what a fucking prick. He writes about getting back together with Cream. They had this reunion a few years ago, maybe like 10 years ago. And he said when he got there and he saw his two former bandmates and he was all excited because he looked better than them. And he was so excited like how <laughs> handsome he was compared to them. Like, <laughs> He's shallow asshole. <laughs> like, oh, geez. He he really is garbage. And I know he's been on our list for a long time and people have been listening or uh, requesting him for a while. So I'm glad we finally did it. I just I didn't know all the stuff. I only knew some of the stuff. Yeah. So you did a really good job. Well, thank you. And that he's trash. Would you like to hear about someone who's not trash? Yes, please. Okay. I think you know who Dave Grohl is. Yes, I do. Dave Grohl was the drummer for Nirvana. He's now the lead singer of the Foo Fighters. He seems to kind of have earned the title of like the nicest guy in rock music. Mm -hmm. And I just put together like a list of like awesome shit Dave Grohl has done. One of my favorite things about Dave Grohl is his interaction with his fans So I picked out a couple of those stories. So when touring, uh, and that's this year too, by the way, he's been touring this year because they have a new album out that's really great. Uh, Margo pointed it out to me, sent it my direction, which is they covered a bunch of Bee Gees and Andy Gibbs songs. And it's really, really fun. It's so fun. The Please DGs, listen. they call them. The D, yes, the DGs, and it's it is really really fun, and they're touring and they're playing those songs. He's been calling fans up on stage to play with them, and he recently brought this like teenage girl up on stage. Her name was Lauren, and he asked her like, "Do you know how to play the guitar?" And she's like, yeah, a little, you know, she responded in the affirmative, and then he like gives his guitar to her. And she plays the song Monkey Wrench. And she was awesome. Awesome. And like, and he just does stuff like this all the time. A couple years ago, Dave Girl broke his leg while on stage. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. Oh, God. Yeah, it was, it was so gruesome. And then in 2019, he was touring and he brought the medic up who like, helped him with his broken leg and Aww. they sang uh, My Hero together. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I think that's awesome. 
Oh, of course, there's this amazing one with this 10 year old girl who plays the drums on YouTube. Mandy and she, Nandy. Yes. Nandy. And she she's done a couple of their songs, but she did Everlong. And then she challenged Dave Grohl. And he's not really on social media, but so many people sent it to him that he had to do it. And they have like a drum battle and it has like tens of millions of views. And they've done a few like back and forth. And he's actually asked her to like meet up with them next time they're on tour in the UK to like perform with them, which I think is amazing. I would love to see that. I would too. Here in California, we had these crazy wildfires back in 2018 and Dave Grohl came to Northern California and he actually fed a bunch of firefighters. Like he gave them barbecue, like he barbecued for them and fed all these firefighters, which I think is amazing. That's rad. He also did it again. Um, I, apparently he has something called Backbeat Barbecue. And also in 2018, he went to the Los Angeles Food Bank and he barbecued. And he worked there for like, it was like 36 hours. And he was there like serving food. Wow. Which I think is, he's such a cool dude. There's a lot of like moshing and like aggressive dancing at Foo Fighters shows. I, re I guess in 2011, there was a, a fight broke out in the audience and he like stopped the show and like pointed out the guy who started it and had him kicked out. And he said, you don't come to my show to fight. You come to my show to fucking dance. <laughs> Um, he supports all kinds of charities. He's like, you know, stand up to cancer, the Elton John AIDS foundation, teen cancer, America. He does all kinds of great work. He is an excellent tipper, by the way, there's all these stories about Dave Grohl leaving massive tips to, to wait staff at restaurants. And my favorite was he was at the rainbow bar and grill and the bill was $333. So he doubled it so that the bill was 666. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a huge tip. Like, that's yeah. awesome. I just, I love the stories of celebrities who give like thousands of dollars in tips. I think it's amazing. There were these miners trapped in Beaconsfield in Australia. And while they were trapped in this mine, one of them asked for an iPod if someone could lower down an iPod with the Foo Fighters album on it, cause he wanted to, they wanted to listen to the Foo Fighters and he sent them a note that said, though I'm halfway around the world right now, my heart is with you. And I want you to know that when you come home, there are two tickets to any food show anywhere and two cold beers waiting for you oh, deal. Wow. And they took, and they took him up on it and they went to the show at the Sydney opera house. And he wrote like, a special instrumental piece for them. And he performed it during the show. I think that's amazing. He's a huge advocate for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans rights. He uh, trolls the Westboro Baptist church, which is one <laughs> of our favorite videos. We shared it in the what a creep group recently where for, you know, this is the church that shows up and they protest at rock concerts and funerals of people who die, like gay people who die and stuff. And they're just, you know, it's all like, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn. And the video that it's in our What a Creep group right now, if you want to see it, he starts playing, you should be dancing. Yeah. For this. And these people, they can't help themselves. Even some of them are kind of shaking it. It's really, really great. And that is our not a creep Dave Grohl. He's the best. And I absolutely love the Foo Fighters. They're one Me of my too. favorite bands ever. And he's just so wonderful. Thank God he's around. I know. And he's he's just got like an amazing sense of humor. You can tell in his music videos that he does. He's done some SNL skits that are really funny. He's um, he's also like people just love him. He'll like perform with anybody, you know, like Queens of the Stone Age. He performed with them. He recently did. I think there's a band called it's like Caged the Elephant. Yeah. And I guess their drummer got sick. So he like filled in for them. Like he just. He loves playing and performing and he loves music and he's super kind. Just more of that, please. And cute. He's, he is super cute. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I would, I would not say no. Well, I, oh, I forgot to give an update, by the way. Good job, Sonia. Oh, yeah, thank you. Patty did uh, meet somebody after Eric and oh, they good. were together for 15 plus years and then they got married. And she, she's a nice married lady. 
she's with someone who's wonderful and she took over the house eric left her a house so okay well i'm glad she's in a good space she's in a good space so i just wanted she to deserves that. it yeah all right you guys that's the episode this week thank you so much for listening to our show Please follow us on all the social things. We love it when you use the Annie Potts gif. We got one from the <laughs> Ghostbusters, especially when you have ideas for once again, what, once again, excuse me, creeps and non creeps. Please sign up for our Patreon page if you're interested in some bonus episodes. We have some affordable options there. We do these bonus episodes. We get kind of, we get even saltier than normal yes, when we, we have a cocktail. Still, yeah, we have a cocktail. We get extra, extra nasty. Sorry, not sorry. And gossipy and. <laughs> It's pretty damn fun. and It you, is super fun. If you like the sound of our voices, we also co-host a show called Dorking Out. And Sonia, do you want to tell them what we're going to be dorking out about next? Yes. We are going to be talking about 1985's Girls Just Want to Have Fun. I'm very excited. I haven't seen this one in a while. Um, I used to watch it all the time. It was on HBO all the time when mm -hmm. I was a kid. So I'm really looking forward to it. This was a request from Dorking Out listener um, Michelle, not my sister Michelle, another Michelle. And she's been asking for like a year. So I'm glad we're finally <laughs> doing it. But it's going to be a fun one. Sonia, where can they find you on the internets? You can find me at the Show.com and the Sonia Show on Twitter and Instagram and sometimes TikTok where I'm there ruining it for the kids. Where can people find you, Margot? I'm on social media at Brooklyn Fit Chick, mostly for Twitter and Instagram. And my site is brooklynfitchick.com. Please be sure to wash your hands. Please stay safe. This Delta variant and this it's scary Lambda stuff, variant, all this shit's coming up. It's really scaring me. So please be safe. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And don't be a creep. Creep. Thank you for listening to us talk about creeps. You can follow us at What a Creep Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But don't follow us too closely. You can email us your creepy stories at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. But please keep your dick pics to yourself. <laughs>